Hello and welcome to the Gain Line, Wales Online's daily rugby debate show on Facebook. I'm Ben James. I'm joined by Simon Thomas. I'm back in the hot seat after a few days of uh, John Doll. Uh, Missed you. Well, uh, I'm very glad to hear it. And we've, um, well, feels like I've never away because we've got uh, plenty of topics to discuss, haven't we? Uh, Wales have announced their team, so have Australia. Plus, I know your favourite talking point of the minute is going to be on the agenda, which is referees. Oh, my word. Um, but we'll, we'll start with some nice positives. We'll start with the Wales team. Um, no real surprises, is there? No, we're still wide awake, by the way, despite our <laughs> four o'clock start this morning. Uh, we've been propping up our eyes with the old matchsticks. We're still going strong, lots of coffee, and we've had the Wales team. No surprise. I think we, most people expected it to be same again. It was interesting, though, to hear Warren Gatland saying that they gave quite a bit of thought and a lot of debate to the back row situation, and in particular whether Ross Moriarty should come back into the starting lineup. Clearly, you know, Ross played a big part during the Six Nations Grand Slam and is a big game player. Um, was on the bench for the opening game against Georgia and they've looked at him and considered him coming in um, I guess it would most realistically have been at number 8 with Josh Navidi moving to 6 and perhaps Aaron Wainwright moving down yep. to the bench you know because um, Aaron perhaps wasn't quite as so prominent against Georgia and he, it makes you realise he's still very young and still learning his trade in international only just turned 22 but in the end um, they've decided to stick with the same back row um, with Moriarty again on the bench and Gatlin's attitude basically seemed to be you know, well you know, nobody really deserves to be dropped. It'd be unfair to drop anyone and give this winning team another opportunity, obviously for a far tougher challenge. Just a reminder, if you are watching, tuning in, this is the Gain Line, Wales Online's daily debate show. Get your questions in on the comments below for this man here and he will answer them. Um, we've also got a poll running on Facebook, uh, which is now that we know the teams, who's going to win? And 89% uh, have said Wales, which oh my is word, I say, um, optimism very nice, yeah, very yeah, nice bit optimism. of optimism. You know, a couple of comments on there. Damian McCartney, or McCarthy rather, if we can get to the breakdown first, we will win. Like, lovely bit of optimism, isn't it? Well, yes, it does help to get there first, doesn't it? <laughs> I suppose that is, you look at the Australia team, you know, the forwards and the breakdown area, we, we, we knew they, what it was going to be. It's yeah, the well, back line. Yeah, well, we touched on the team. And just to say that the, the pack is the same. Um, the changes that they've made for them are all behind. Um, the scrum. Um, they've got new halfbacks in Kenya and Bernard Foley, and there was one enforced change. Obviously, we much talked about Rhys Hodge um, suspended. So you, you've got the the veteran, 35 year old, I think he is now, Adam yeah. Ashley Cooper coming on the wing, and um, Curtis Beale has um, uh, dropped out of the side. Ben Petty has come in, you know, at, at fullback. Uh, what do we make of the changes? Well, I think certainly Foley, um, Gatlin himself has said today that his um, inclusion ahead of Christian Leifano suggest to Gatlin that Australia are going to play more of a kicking game because he probably is their best tactical kick also you know could have creative presence with ball in hand but he's been out of favour in the Australian setup for a little while so that and he wasn't in the 23 even for their opening no. game against Fiji so he's like leapfrogged back into the side um, Genia is less of a surprise because he came off the bench against Fiji when they were in a tricky situation um, and really sort of took the game by control brought much more of a sort of calm head to proceedings a huge experience of course over 100 caps and he was expected to come in. And Beal dropping out is an interesting one. Beal is one of the you know Australia's most uh, you know dangerous attackers. But they seem to have gone for um, a player with more ability and more security under the high ball, which perhaps is seen as a slight a weakness for a Beal. And with Dan Bigger's kick and reclaim and kicking strategy, you can see why they've done that. But as we always say, they can tinker with the backs as much as they want. Um, but I still maintain that it's going to be one up front because you look at Australia's strengths as demonstrated this year and especially then against Fiji, it was the scrum, the driving line out, Wales' scrum has had problems sometimes this season, uh, so, so you fear possibly them getting some set piece superiority there and it, you can also potentially see them getting a breakdown dominance because they've got one of the best practitioners in the world, I know I bang on yeah. a lot of them about, but I do, I'm a huge fan of David Pocock and if he's anything like at his best on the weekend, he's just an immovable object over the ball and it's going to be a challenge for Wales so uh, yeah it's a strong Australian team but then it's a strong Wales team yep. and I was really looking forward to it. We talked about the personnel but we've got uh, a number of questions coming in about sort of the, the, the game plan and, and the tactics. Um, yeah. Richard Needs wants to know how we'll play, should, should we run at Foley rather than kick in and Steve Lewis uh, asks what sort of game plan should we employ on 
Sunday, uh, offensive or defensive, and, and hopefully take our chances? Well, to run at Foley, you'd have to find him. And, and <laughs> they have been known in the past on opposition ball to, to move him out of the sort of you know firing line to fly off to Generally, wing or yeah. even into the backfield. So, you know, you'll have to <laughs> seek him out first, you know. But in terms of how Wales will play, we really don't know because this has been the big talking part throughout the World Cup where we, the implication and suggestion for Warren Gatton that he wasn't going to show all his aces in either the warm up games or the opening group match against Georgia. And you guess he's got something coming, you know. And I suppose for it to be really effective, we shouldn't know what it is, should we? Because if we, if we knew, the Australia yeah. would probably know. So let's see what they've got coming up. Absolutely. 23 man lineups, or maybe is there something like that? That'd be a novel, wouldn't it? <laughs> Getting him off the bench. I think the Wales lineups going far better than the Australian lineups. Yeah. So it could be. Um, we're getting lots of support in the comments for Wales, unsurprisingly, given the poor results. Uh, Christian Roberts, uh, Iris Griffiths, all wishing uh, Wales um, good luck. Uh, Kerry jo- uh, Jonathan says Wales have issues at the breakdown with Pocock and Hooper. They need to resolve those issues. Um, very good point. Um, I think that's Wales Australia teams put to bed. Um, of course. While we're here working the 4 a.m. shifts in the office, uh, we do have a man out in Japan, Matthew Southcombe, and I believe he's been wandering the streets of Tokyo this evening um, to record a little video for us, uh, sort of with his thoughts on the team. So, so this is it. So the teams have been named then, and Wales against Australia is just days away here in Tokyo. Two days, in fact, to be accurate. I guess the mood in the camp at the moment is pretty confident and quietly confident. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. Wales haven't had a great record against Australia in recent years. They did crucially, they did beat them in November last year, and that win will have done them uh, the world of good, and especially for their confidence as well. You hear ex-players like Sam Walton, somebody who's very close to the camp, obviously, saying that that win was massive for them and for their confidence heading into this World Cup. Players now know that they can beat Australia, so psychologically, and I guess subconsciously as well, it gives them that little bit of belief, that extra little bit of confidence that they can get the job done and I guess if you look at the two camps as well they're kind of chalk and cheese at the moment because you've got Australia really who've made four changes to their side lots of chopping and changing not a lot of continuity there looks as if they've side as well to negate Wales's threats rather than play to their own which is always a good place to be in uh, from Wales's point of view off the field as well they've been dealing with a bit of a saga of their own the whole gone a little bit out of control from their point of view further than the sighting and obviously losing Hodge as well for three games is the first thing to deal with but then the fallout from that as well has been a bit of a disaster for them you've got the player himself saying that he doesn't know what world rugby's framework is and that he wasn't trained on it which doesn't really show Australia in in a great light than the coaching staff and then we know that Alan Roland has been in and speaking to these teams the referee chief of course just explaining how things are going to work in this tournament so it was a bit of a strange thing to come out and then you've got Michael Checker then coming out and blasting World Rugby for putting that in the, in the sort of notes from the judicial hearing. So it's been a bit of a difficult week and you've got Checker ranting about, about that. You've got four changes. It just If you look at the two camps, you could kind of say, well, I know which one I would prefer to be in. Uh, Wales haven't made any changes to their start in 15. Uh, Warren Gatland saying basically they didn't see the need. And I guess the, the attitude would be if it's not broke, don't try and fix it because they played well against Georgia. There was room for improvement there, uh, but things went relatively well in that match. And there was a discussion around do they bring in Nicky Smith at Loosehead? Um, obviously, Wynne Jones was picked against Georgia for his scrummaging prowess, but perhaps there's a little bit more emphasis on the breakdown this time around. Um, and that's where Nicky Smith comes into his own. Warburton in the past compared him to Gethin Jenkins, who was also very good in that area of the game. But they've stuck with Wynne Jones, who himself is pretty good around the field as well, so let's not do him a disservice. Uh, on that one. The other discussion really was around Aaron Wainwright and Ross Moriarty in the back row. Now, people thought that Moriarty was perhaps being rested for this game, but it it turns out that was an out-and-out drop-in, really. Um, And Wainwright, I guess it wouldn't have been fair to to drop him. He didn't do anything wrong against George, and he just continues to impress. Now, this this is definitely the biggest test that he's ever played in. Um, You know, we're at a World Cup now. Warren Gatlin pretty much admitted that this was the biggest test for, for Aaron Wainwright so far, but all the signs have been good, you know, he's never let Wales down, he's always impressed, um, and he continues to do that, and you know, you, <laughs> we've been told in the press conference today that there's been a bit of edge in training, sounds like things have been a little bit spicy, Warren Gatlin saying that a few of the guys who weren't selected were disappointed with that team news and, and were keen to make a statement, so um, there's been a bit of bloodshed, it sounds like things have got a bit edgy, and you know, it doesn't take 
uh, Sherlock Holmes to figure out which players he's referring to, but we won't cast any aspersions on that one. Um, but it's good to have that little edge in training as well, because at the end of the day, this is a test match. You want, you want the players pushing each other. It's a huge game on, on the weekend, on Sunday, because whilst it's probably not do or die, um, when this Wales team gets on a roll, and we've seen it before in Grand Slams and, and in previous World Cups, when they get confident, when they get that momentum, and when they get on a roll, a win like this could really lead to something special. And, and not only that, it, it does put them in the more favourable half of the draw as well, assuming the other groups go the way that you think they're going to go. So it's all building up quite nicely, really, and, and it's almost time for, for the game, which is which can't come quick enough now, really, for, for the fans, the players and the journalists, to be honest with you. We've got the captain's run uh, tomorrow here in Tokyo and then we'll have the game on Sunday. And of course, you can follow everything that happens between now and then and during the game on Wales Online. <coughs> So that's Matthew Southcombe's uh, views from Japan. Uh, nice to see him wandering around the block, no doubt looking for a Greg's. Or a sushi Greg's. <laughs> I think he's, I think he's uh, tried some octopus and I think he enjoyed it. So uh, we'll see how he's, he's getting on yeah, with good. the culinary uh, senses later in the trip. Um, let's move on to the, another talking point. We mentioned it briefly before, which is um, referees. Uh, it's been one that's sort of dominated headlines the whole week over, the whole World Cup over, in fact, hasn't it? Well, very much, you know, since the kind of Wales played on Monday, beating Georgia, it's been the to topic which has been, well, the overriding topic of the tournament. And it seems like there's been something every day. Just today, this morning, where we've been on, there's been another couple of developments where the uh, England centre, Piers Francis, has been cited for um, a dangerous tackle in yesterday's game against the USA. And also from that game, we also remember it was the first red card of the tournament yesterday, John Quill. And now he, he quite quickly has had his disciplinary hearing and he's been uh, suspended for three weeks, which has you know, provoked a bit of a reaction because some people questioning that it's uh, the same punishment that was given, the same sanction that was given to Reese Hodge and uh, Ray Lilo. And yet a lot of people feeling that uh, Quill's you know, direct shoulder to the head, pretty blatant, pretty much a cheap shot, cheap shot. really, has had the same punishment. So that's again added another level of confusion and and so people thinking it was quite lenient, you know. So every day is a giving day for us journalists in terms of you know the incident. But I mean, all seriousness, you know, it, it hasn't been a great um, opening really to the tournament in terms of the officiating. We went into the World Cup. But this is going to be the stage to make it absolutely crystal clear all the work that's been done over the last couple of years in terms of reducing collisions to the head, brain injuries by bringing the height of the tackle down, clear messages unequivocal framework but it's just not worked because what we've had unfortunately is a series of incidents where players have not been red carded on the pitch yeah. and yet those players have subsequently been cited which essentially means it's deemed a red card event and we've had two of them banned so you know it's one thing pundits and players as we've heard not quite understanding the uh, the framework and the, the public you know and, and fans but when you have the match officials you should know them inside out still seemingly not able to implement them correctly it does really, it really does muddy the waters. And it's, it's a topic that's gone on a lot of questions. I know on your yes. Twitter feed, um, we got one here from Gavin Collins. Uh, the inconsistency of the bans given to players by World Rugby is becoming a farce. Uh, same punishment, three matches for Reese Hodge and Quill. Mm. Um, can anything be done about the inconsistency of the bans being given out? Well, the ironic thing is they're actually very consistent. They're all getting three <laughs> weeks. It seems to be the standard procedure, doesn't it? I must admit, they talk about entry points, so mid-entry point, low entry point. I was surprised that Quill was deemed in the same entry point, i.e. So your starting point of six weeks. And, of course, then you always get this other thing, which you know enrages a lot of people, where you see uh, the player almost every time gets his punishment halved from the six weeks to three weeks. But I think the phrase is good character isn't that you know and I, I would I want one day to see a, a, a disciplinary report that says like oh he didn't give it he had very bad character that man you know he, he certainly didn't have any mitigating factors you know not bringing the right biscuits in or that's, something that's like that age old one not oh, bringing the right biscuits it, honestly yeah as I say every day a giving day in this story absolutely and um, we'll take one more quick question on this um Farrell didn't get a HIA um and if it's a red card, it's a, it's a hit to the head. Yeah. So I mean, it's a very valid. Why why is this not? It's a, I, I, mean, I don't know the answer. I have to be honest. A very valid point, you know, because the, the point is that if it's deemed clearly, and everyone can see with their eye that it was a direct shoulder to the head, that's what the referee described it as. You would think. I mean, in cricket now we have a situation where any hit on the the, the helmet has to be a you know 
treatment looked at or a player having medical treatment and we talk a lot about the scrutiny of this in world rugby now and yet there's no HIA you know for Farrell and his other incidents where there's been bangs the head hasn't happened as well uh, so yeah that's another aspect they've got to look at really isn't it so it's a good question okay uh, we're still getting lots of uh, support for Wales in the comments uh, Arwen Thomas flying out tonight will be there on Sunday oh lucky uh, boy fantastic oh. uh, Beryl Perman, uh, 84, and she'll be running every yard for the Wales team. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Leslie Watkins, an Australian, but when Wales plays, it's always going to be a tight call. No doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, Paul Ricketts is watching from South Africa. He expects Wales to win by 12. That's a nice, bold prediction. It's very bold. Um, and Nick Larder, the Aussies have strengthened their side, but I don't think they are strong enough. Um, one final question. Well, you'll go a bit Derek Brockway on this one, as opposed to... Uh, I can't think of a rugby player. Derek Winnell. There we go. Oh, That's well, a, there's a Derek. Um, Save. Gareth Davis. <laughs> that was, didn't know where I was going with that segue then. Any idea what the weather conditions are going to be like, I suppose? No. <laughs> we, no, we, I don't. No, but I, I'm sorry. I have not looked up my to Tokyo weather forecast. I can't even tell what it's going to be like. I went out today without a mark on. got soaked. That shows what I know about the weather. They're just as good as my score predictions. To be fair, we did all those pieces about Toyota having a, having a roof that didn't work for the storm and it never yeah. came. So uh, you can never trust the weather. That's one thing we can be sure of. But well, that's it for today's game line. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time uh, with all the build-up to Wales Australia. But until then, catch everything on Wales Online.